what are you doing guy or what are you doing guy of the week here judd why don't you take this one here i'm gonna pick on a very popular guy in this town at least he was until sunday what are you doing guy what are you doing kevin o'connell what are you doing for the second time if not the third time but i'm gonna go second for sure dallas at home and then the packers on sunday your arch rival your arch, I don't care when you play them. I don't care where you play them. Um, you want to exchange punches with the Green Bay Packers in any way, shape, or form. What were you doing in the week leading up to this game when you took them, you took your team outside to practice? I thought you were preparing for this game. I thought you were going to have a good week, as you called it after the game on Sunday, a good week of preparation. Good and week yet, of, a great week of preparation. <laughs> Preparation H. Yeah. Like Dex said, you block the damn punt. You're at the one or the two. You got a chance to punch it in. Really punch them quickly, too, right? So, like, you got a chance to to you pretty easily score a touchdown. And now it's seven rip and you've set a tone. Instead, you allow the tone to be set because your offense, and by the way, this is your baby, your car can't get from point A to point B, and it's one yard. It's one yard. I've got a list of things here from like, what are you doing against your arch rival? And you have a chance, keep in mind, to end their season. Like this is the ultimate we've got scoreboard because you could have left saying, we just eliminated the Green Bay Packers. Yeah. The team that we hate the most. Your offense was a train wreck. You had no answers, which by the way, you need to, you know, you know to a certain degree what your quarterback is capable of doing. And one thing he is not capable of doing is pulling his team from the fire by himself. But instead, Jefferson, when you knew damn well what was going to happen there too. The Jair Alexander thing was not like, a, oh my God, they where'd this guy come from? You knew he was going to travel with, with Justin the entire game because he didn't in week one. And that was a major mistake. And you have no answers there. Kirk Cousins starts to disintegrate. And there's no response. There's no response to anything. You basically gave up early on trying to run the ball on a cold day. Um, your defensive coordinator is a mess. And you keep like, he's your defensive coordinator is the stubborn kid who's like, eh, if I act like I'm listening this week, he'll leave me alone next week. And so every once in a while, we sit down with Donna Shell and we say, easy Ed. We need more from you. I can tell you right now that I can scheme up your defense for, for me being an offensive guy. And that's like, I got it, coach. I got it. I got it. And he makes some changes. And then he goes back to, but my system works. He told you all you need to hear at the podium. I think it was three weeks ago when he said my system works. He wasn't joking around. He, that was what he believes. And yet we just continue to watch this. Um, the other thing, post game, small thing, but to me, frustrating. So O'Connell's done a marvelous job of galvanizing this team and setting a culture that I really do like. But he was asked a couple of questions at his post game very fairly about the conditions on the field and why guys were slipping. And if they were prepared with the right cleats, which, by the way, in football is pretty damn important. Mm -hmm. And he basically said, well, we told them, but you're never going to tell someone what type of cleats they can wear. Uh, what? Yeah, you did. Yes, you can. And they no, all had to change their these cleats. These are a bunch of 24. Well, in the Vikings case, it's like some 24 year olds, some 32 year olds. Sure. But, but you're. But if, if you have coaches that have been in the NFL for 25 or in KOC's case, 15 years, they know better. Yes. And they have former Packers like Smith, like Sullivan, who basically talked about what that field is like, because that. I think it was about five years back or so that field now is a combination of grass and, and artificial turf of some sort that's woven in because it used to be Brown. Like the grass used to die, mm -hmm. which looked bad, but probably provided a little bit better traction because now it's this, it's this combination thing. So it looks green, but it's not all grass. Someone speculated that they water it down aggressively for opponents yeah, that they want to slow down to, which would make sense. Just like we're they, gonna water, and they can do that. Water it but, down. We're going to run the ball and we're going to make them slide all over the place with their receivers. But yeah. the fact is, like, I completely agree with empowering your players to a certain point. But if you know one thing, like the traction is going to be a big deal, then you know what? It's very much your place to say, here's what 
I need you guys to do, not would you please. So Kevin O'Connell, in the Dallas loss and this loss, I feel like you sort of got exposed, or you did just flat, flat out get exposed. What are you doing, guy? You are in charge of this football team, and you just got embarrassed by your arch rival, and you did nothing to really help. Kevin O'Connell. Dude, what are you doing, guy? What are you doing, guy? Um, yeah, it's, uh, that, that's great, dude. I think I, Very good. I don't have a whole lot to add to that. That was a great rant. Nice job. And you know what? Ho- hopefully he learns. It's just that there's a fine line between empowering and not taking control when necessary. Yeah. No, I think um, I guess the, the one thing I will add is he is still trying to feel some of this stuff out as a first year coach, too. And, yep. you know, how how much should he come down? How much should he be patient? I think there is. In fact, oh, let's just transition back into statements here. I'll give you this one. One of the things that he's learning is he hired the wrong defensive coordinator. Now, there's some personnel issues. You can maybe put some of that on Kwesi. You know, why are there a bunch of 31 year old, 32 year old dudes running around on defense? Maybe have one of them or two of them. I think just getting younger and faster would help this Vikings defense. Maybe they don't know where they're supposed to be all the time, but at least they can cover ground and right. make some plays, you know, fly around a little bit. And so my uh, my next statement here is, I don't know that Ed Donatel makes it to the team plane. Well, if they play a home game and they lose, I don't think Ed Donatel makes it to the following morning before he's fired, whenever the Viking season is over. I think it's the first big move that Kevin O'Connell makes. He's already shown some frustration in press conferences. They've had to have come to Jesus meetings a couple times this year to figure out ways that they can unlock defensive players. And for this to happen again, and, and I get that like, Two of the touchdowns were not the defense's fault. But the defense, let's take those away. The defense still gave up a ton of yards on the ground, 27 points of their own. It was a disaster again. It was not a performance that you can hang your hat on. They played one of the plays, a third down play with 10 guys on the field. That alone should disqualify you at this point. Dude, why? Your your veterans are screaming at you on the field. Call a timeout. Yep. What are you doing, dude? Either just run a player out. And by the way, Harrison Phillips was the guy that ran out for the next play. So if they were a they were a defensive lineman short, I believe, on the the, the third down and ten. But God, like it's a third and ten. What are you doing? And they got it. And and Nance was clowning them. Romo was clowning them. Like at one point, players are screaming. The play, like, and Rogers is like. What the hell? Like, he took his time, so he yeah. gave them a- – and Romo draws the Chiron and circles the sideline and said, just run a guy on from here. Dude. Run this guy on and he's circling guys they could have run on the field. It's embarrassing. It was It's awful. embarrassing. Yeah. And for your and, – and you could – I'm sure if you were to really pick it apart and do a pie chart of blame for just that one play, there's probably a, whoever is the position coach on the position that was shorted, right – and I, I so again, I think it was the defensive. So you could say like the defensive line coach or something. You're in charge of your position grouping for each play. It's like we talked about this on Ventline when when uh, the Vikings had 12 men on the field in the NFC Championship game. Eric Bieniemy was the running back slash fullback position coach that like misheard the formation and ran an extra guy out there. But at the end of the day, there's 10 guys on the field. The ball's not being snapped yet, and you're the defensive coordinator you need to step into action in that situation and either run down KOC. We need a timeout, 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 or just run, literally run a human being, any human being with a uniform on the field. And for him to be paralyzed in that moment was just such a like encapsulation of the entire season under Ed Donatel for that defense. So. All right. My next statement, I'm going to say super bowl or bust. Because I saw a great tweet from our buddy Steve Palazzolo at PFF yesterday during the Vikings game. I think he tweeted this out probably near the first half, by halftime. He tweeted, the Vikings are either winning the Super Bowl this season or losing a playoff game by 40 points. There is no in-between, and I could not agree more with this. Now, the funny thing is, is this tweet, the Vikings are winning the Super Bowl, or they're losing a playoff game by 40. I've already experienced the losing a playoff game by 40 basically twice. I'll chalk the Eagles in the Giants loss together. I know that wasn't the 40 burger that uh, they did. They laid against Philadelphia, but it basically felt like that. It's either Super Bowl or you're losing a playoff game by 40 points this season. 
Um, I think he's right. <laughs> the, the Vikings are 12 and four. They have banked enough wins. They have a path here to host potentially multiple playoff games still, despite all this negative point differential and these blowout losses. So there's a path for them to get to the Super Bowl that's a lot easier than the other teams in the conference just because they have the home field advantage potentially. But they also could lose that playoff game either at home or on the road by 40 points, and it probably wouldn't surprise me. So it's Super Bowl or bust here. Let's go. It's amazing. Yeah, I saw another tweet too from... Uh, Aaron Schatz at, at the founder. Of, I think he's the founder of the managing editor at Football Outsiders, and uh, so their metric. And we bring this up on the State of the Offense Thursday. We do offensive DVOA, but they have you know, full team DVOA, which is essentially where does your team rank if you take every play that's been played this season within the context? That, like they throw out garbage yardage, or they reduce the value of it. They they take into account strength of schedule everything they just they have a an analytical way of ranking teams and it's from year to year very very accurate in terms of who the best teams are. The Vikings, according to DVOA, have you guys seen this? Yeah, no. I did. Are ranked twenty eighth in the NFL. And he he sent that out. He said the Vikings after that game are now twenty eighth in DVOA. This is not not a joke. He goes, what a crazy season or whatever the tweet was. So yeah, like I could like I don't I I. I can't see them winning the Super Bowl at this point because I just there's no way that they can just walk this high wire through four of the best teams in the NFL. But right. I could see them pulling out two magical victories or something and then getting stomped by 40 in the NFC Championship game. But it's it's hard to have faith that they can win four games doing it this way at this point. With these they step in these right. landmines and it's like <laughs> not even a close game after and the first really five And it gets really good minutes. teams like you said. Like Yeah quality opponents yeah here's my next statement it might be time to rethink substitution patterns did you guys notice that for the second consecutive week there were series on which the linebackers but more importantly in this case safeties were taken out and rested for a series Mm -hmm. on the robert tunyon touchdown pass in lambeau field Easy Ed took Harrison Smith off the field. And yes, that was Josh Metellus. God bless him. I think he's a nice player. That was Josh Metellus in for that series, which led to Rogers first touchdown pass of the game. Now I understand Harrison Smith's a veteran. I understand he's banged up and I understand that, that you are trying to put into motion uh, late in the season, a sort of rest factor. But when you take, if you're going to have Harrison Smith on your roster on in Lambeau Field, he needs to be playing because he's the guy who understands what's going on. He sets a lot of things in motion. He is he is a savvy veteran. He's no he's not the player that he once was, but he's probably yeah. smarter than ever, okay? And Tunyon, who's a tight end, catches that ball and you could tell there was safety confusion there. Guess who doesn't probably get confused? Harrison Smith. Yeah. Now, I understand against the Giants at home, where it's far more of a controlled environment because you are the home team, Ed. I understand that you might think it's smart to, to rest a guy like Smith for a series or two, and it, that actually comes from KOC. But the point is, I'm sure the timing is up to Donatel. But in Lambeau Field, you're telling me, in a game that's getting away, getting away but not gone yet, you're telling me that that's the time to pair Cam Bynum with Metellus it and feels very rest twins like, doesn't it? Harrison Smith. I mean, come on. Yeah. Yes, so Harrison, right. the Vikings. Let's see here. I don't know how many total snaps they had. It was like sixty-three total defensive snaps, and Harrison Smith was out there for forty-seven. And I'm guessing he was out of the game in some garbage time down the stretch too. So I think that was kind of the one series that he was out for. Um, does that one series? keep you fresher well, I, I, and it's like Aaron Rodgers you're playing not I Danny know. Dimes it's like, like like you said it's very twins like it's very like well but this is how we do things now yeah I do think they've had some success rotating defensive linemen and keeping oh, some guys God, yeah. fresh who are in the trenches on every play 100 percent. and I do like that they have the last few weeks they have found a bunch of snaps for Brian Asamoah so Brian Asamoah played 26 snaps totally yesterday agree. so I, li- I like some of that um but I'm kind of with you they don't I don't know, man. Harrison Smith, 
I don't know that you need to rest him as often as you would a defensive lineman in a football game. But Well, and if you're going to rest him for one series, it's not worth it when you're playing Aaron bleeping Rodgers, right? Yeah. And, and like next yeah. week, probably, he probably do, does not play. I'm fine with that. But what I'm not fine with is this game again against your arch rival who you can put a pin in their playoff hopes yeah. and you're like, well, this is our new system now. You're right. That's very twins like. Yeah, it's uh, it's rough. Um, Declan, before I get to the next statement here, mm-hmm. uh, do we have any 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 people that that scored big on underdog that you saw here? Anyone that that hit a bunch of unders for the Vikings? <laughs> I guess uh, old Dex tweets at the under, uh, you know, on 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 the on the AJ Dillon. But unfortunately, you took the over on a Dalvin Cook touchdown. And when oh, you parlay kids. What are you doing, guy? That's the, what are you doing, guy? It's Dex tweets here. Come on, Dalvin. Just put, when they got at the one, I was like, oh, perfect. My underdog slip's going to get it here. They're going to hand it off to Dalvin. Nice no. little six points and a nice little uh, parlay action for no. Dex. No, that's not it. But that's the fun sweat I get on underdog fantasy, which is the best and easiest way to play fantasy sports. You can sign up now, too, with promo code SCORE. S-K-O-R. They'll match your first deposit up to 100 bucks, And show us those slips. If you did take those unders, send us in those slips. We'll gladly show them on the show. Go download the Underdog Fantasy app. All right. My next statement here, boys. We touched on this on VetLine. I want to bring this, this number to the table here because it's illustrating a huge problem. I guess my statement is I think it's time for Adam Thielen to ride off into the Vikings' sunset. I don't know how they make that happen with the contract extension they gave him and all the guaranteed money that he is still owed to the cap. But when Thielen is matched up against man coverage after yesterday's game now, so going into the game, he was 88th out of 100 qualified receivers, and he's it's basically the same uh, after yesterday. Now there's only 94 qualified receivers, and he's 85th. So he's one of the 10 worst receivers receivers in the NFL yards per route run against man coverage four years ago not that long ago 2018 yep he was one of the six or seven best receivers in the NFL yards per route run against man coverage in 2018 he was ahead of OBJ Michael Thomas and DeAndre Hopkins those three guys were in their prime it was like the first three guys you draft in your fantasy league right in 2018 and Thielen was better than those guys yards per route run against man man coverage. So uh, again, I don't have a, a like a breakdown of how often he faced man yesterday in front of me, but when they are devoting the Packers that much attention to Justin Jefferson, hey, we're going to put Jair Alexander on him and always have one or two other guys rotating his direction. That means Thielen has matchups, one on one matchups, either in either in zone or in man. Right? He can't beat the man matchups. He can't. It's, it's, you know, that's supposed to, yesterday is supposed to be a day where he feasts for like nine or 10 catches and 90, 95, 100, 110 yards, right? And um, he just can't get there anymore. And so KJ Osborne gets a little bit of it, but I thought that was a really telling stat that I found on Pro Football Focus that, wow, like statistically, you see it with your eyes, but the last four years, the erosion is, um, is pretty eye popping. Yeah, it's it's eye popping, but it's not completely shocking. Like it, like we've seen him, I and mean, he's been hurt a lot. And the guy, to his credit, played an incredibly physical, hard game. Like like yeah. it, he didn't try to avoid contact, so he was going to slow down. I, I think it's why we expressed some uh, surprise at the time when they signed him in the summer to the extension, because it's like okay, you just basically locked yourself into a guy who is clearly uh, has tread. And look, it's a salary cap league, and it's football. It's not a sport where you can be – like, the worst thing in football that, that you can have is a blind loyalty to names because that causes you then to – when those names, their play starts to dissipate, you're stuck. Yeah. Yeah, and he's – I feel like that last contract extension, you're paying him for the work he's already done, not the Terrible work he's idea. going to do. Amen. Big football yeah. thing right there. Yeah. Uh, back to people. Dex here. Yeah, one more from me. Uh, I'll just say get healthy. Get healthy here. You got the Bears coming up. You're pretty much locked into the three seed. There is an opportunity where you can still snag that second seed if somehow David Blau leads an epic win uh, against Brock Purdy. Who would have thought that it was Brock Purdy versus David Blau if you would have said in week week one of this season, yeah. hey, 
San Francisco will be playing for the one seed, but it won't be Trey Lance. It won't be Jimmy Garoppolo. It'll be Brock Purdy. And then Arizona's going to have an old quarterback fiasco and just disastrous season on its own. And they're going to snag a practice squad guy off the Vikings te- yeah. uh, team. And he's going to start the last season uh, for them, too. So I would say get get healthy here. Just take th- this. have this be a nice Nick Mullins-led game. Hell, I don't care if they start Josh Rosen, for God's sakes, who, who they also added to their practice squad. The Vikings did. So... Just take this week off here. You know what your fate is. You have to get right when you, when you get to the playoffs here. There's no point for a big starter to play a lot of snaps. Just take it off and get healthy. I agree. I I totally agree with this. Is there any reason to risk further damage and injury? I no. guess I guess no, one really school of thought is uh, un, until you're officially eliminated from the seeding that you that you try as hard as you can, but you might still be able to beat the Bears playing backups. I doubt it, but because yeah. they're <laughs> they're going to want to finish their season on a high note. Although they are also, aren't they, sort of fighting for the number one pick? So maybe they rest some guys. Yeah, and the, the Bears Cardinals, might rest guys in order to get the number one pick. And the Cardinals will be completely checked out. They don't care. Yeah, yeah, I'm with Declan. Yeah, just uh, lick your wounds. San Fran's probably not losing at home to the Cardinals in this case. And rest oh. up for the Giants. Yeah. All right, yeah. Judd, give us uh, give us one more statement on your end. It might be too late. It might be too late. If Brian O'Neill is lost for the season, um, that's that is to me the anchor of that line. Like he's Darius is probably your best player now, just as far as God given abilities there. But Brian O'Neill has turned himself into a Pro Bowl type of rock solid player, um, and I, I sense he leads that line. And if he's out now. And you're going to do what? Sign a guy off the street? Plug in Oli Udo? Like, come on. And now Bradbury's got the back. Um, I'm sure he, he won't play against the Bears. That'll be five games missed. So then you're certainly uh, hoping he can come back for the playoffs. But the problem with that is it's a back injury. So, like, he could come back for the playoffs. But if that thing flares up again in game, you can't continue to play. Um, this offensive line certainly showed improvement. I want to make that clear. They they were not to me near the train wreck that they've been in recent years. They're starting to come together. Bradbury, to his credit, I shocked me by playing well. All of that being said, if you're going to tell me that potentially the the offensive line in a playoff game at any point, I don't care starting or not, right, could be center Reed, right guard Ingram, right tackle Udo. Yeah. Um, I'm going to tell you it's been fun, and I'll see you in 2023 in training camp. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. There, there's a – man, I mean, it, and whenever this thing ends, whether it's in a blowout loss in the first round of the playoffs or maybe they somehow sneak their way into the NFC Championship game, there are so many interesting discussions to be had between, like, middle, oh, late God. January and – when March free agency opens up, it's going to be like a five or six week frenzy and cheap plug on Mackie and Judd and on Purple Daily. <laughs> we will have you covered for all of those discussions. I have one more statement. Late last night, I was curious. I, I, I thought in my head, the Vikings just seem to struggle playing on grass on the road. I mean, the only time they play on grass is on the road. Unless you go back to the 70s. And so I did a search on stathead.com. Over the past 20 seasons, I just went back the last 20 years, the Vikings have the NFL's fifth. So here's my statement. The Vikings are atrocious on grass. Over the past 20 seasons, the Vikings have the NFL's fifth worst record in road games played on grass. So I took every team. I took away. Their, there's a lot of teams that play home games on grass. So I took, I stripped out all of the home games on grass. Every NFL team, road games on grass. Vikings have the fifth worst record, 37 37- 62 and 2 including playoffs in road grass games yep. since 2003. Yep. 37 62 and 2. It's pretty bad. They've been a they've been I think across the board pretty much a, notor- a notoriously bad team on grass and especially in cold since they 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 went to the to the dome in 82. Yeah. They just That's, uh... And like you said before Phil on on PD part of the problem is this team also is not very tough. This like, is like you're one of the least grass, tough Vikings teams I can remember. You got to maul teams on grass. You got to get yeah. the running game going. You got to get the snot flying <laughs> on grass. 
That'll get that'll get you the football song. Thank you. I was trying to maul, and then I'm like, okay, I got to go load a snot. But just but, like, yeah, they just they pass more than almost any team. They play off coverage more than almost every team. It's just it's not exactly do you smash think, mouth football. Do you think 2023, for the first time in years, it feels like can finally bring this this offense a balance? Like it feels like with Zim, we were constantly bitching because they didn't pass enough. Yeah, and now we're like, you know. KOC, it's third and one. You can run the ball. Like, I, will 2023 finally bring a year of balance? Yeah, well, it's a, uh, I don't know. It's a, it is a new year, but it is the 2022 season still. So right. No, to... that's what I'm saying. I'm probably, <laughs> I'm probably talking about September of 23. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that is, uh, that's your Mackie and Judd episode for today. Again, a reminder over on Purple Daily, our full Monday episode with the pie chart of blame and um, our hottest Vikings takes. And also Vikings vent line from yesterday. If you if you can only listen to like a ten minute portion, go like halfway in and find Bob in Pennsylvania and his brother just screaming for like five minutes at the at the screen. Just classic stuff there. So thanks for hanging out with us here, uh, Daily Minnesota Sports Entertainment and Therapy on Mackie and Judd. We'll see you guys tomorrow.